Hello and welcome to another lecture in the Abrelin ao Vivo series. Abrelin ao Vivo is an initiative of Brazilian Linguistics Association. Today, I'd like to introduce Damian Blasi. Dr. Blasi is a fellow of the Data Science Initiative Initiative and the Human Evolutionary Biology, Biology Department at Harvard University, a research associate at the Department of Linguistic and Cultural Evolution at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology and the Linguistic Convergence at the Laboratory of HSE University, Russia. The title of the, his lecture is World Wide Linguistic Diversity as a Messy Yet Informative Experiment. Before we start, I'd like to thank Damien Blasi for accepting a Berlin's invitation and to say that questions and comments are very welcome at the chat. Please join me and welcome Damien Blasi. Hi, hello everyone. Can you can you see me? Um, I yeah. I was in understanding that now is uh, Caius' turn for introducing himself, but uh, I don't know. Should I just proceed then? Okay. Well, uh, let's go forward then. All right, can you all see my screen? I yeah. hope so, thank you. So, hi everyone and welcome to my Aberlin talk. I'm a huge fan of the series. I watched about the dozen talks so far and what they have produced is an incredible resource. We have a snapshot of the market of linguistic ideas around the 2020s. I'm particularly happy with the fact that this is a South American initiative and I'm delighted by the fact that they reach out to Cayo Cinemaki and I couldn't have thought of someone better. So thanks so much, Caius, for staying until this late for doing this. I really appreciate it. Um, now, before we get started, I would like to do some quick announcements. I apologize for not being able to secure simultaneous translation for the deaf. The best I can do now is to make sure I'll curate the subtitles with the help of Abraline and this presentation so that you get what I'm actually saying and not whatever Google can get out of my English. Second, I know this time slot is not convenient for everyone. I got lots of requests for moving the time around, and some of you will be watching this talk post facto. So if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to me at the email address that you see now in the screen. Now I'm going to share that again at the end. Now, this time of the year, I cannot guarantee I'll reply soon, but eventually I'll reply. And third, I, I'm really sorry for the timing. In about one hour, Brazil faces Peru for a spot in the Copa America finals. And this is a big, big deal. So I'll try to be as succinct as possible so we can all wrap this up and then enjoy the match. Okay, then let's get started. My object of study is linguistic diversity, worldwide linguistic diversity. Depending on how you count, they are between 6,500 to 7,000 languages spoken and signed in the world today. And about 40% of that diversity remains to be described. We continue encountering new languages as well as new linguistic features that keep adding to the wealth of diversity we are familiar with. Roughly four languages go extinct every year, but the general trend is for most languages to shrink through time. And this will only get worse as a handful of languages take over. Now, crucially, there is variation in every dimension of description. Languages differ in their morphosyntactic resources, in the things they express obligatorily, in the categories encoded in the grammar, 
their speech sounds or signs, and much, much more. If you came to this talk through the usual Abrolin channels, then probably you're already well aware of this. Also, probably you're aware that linguistic diversity is the research topic of some subfields within linguistics. However, I do not research linguistic diversity from the point of view of traditional linguistics. Instead, I regard linguistic diversity as a main part of human nature. And my point is that we cannot fully understand human cognition, behavior, and culture without understanding and acknowledging this diversity. But let me give you a little bit more of background on this. So first of all, the last decade has witnessed more and more researchers challenging the universality of psychology and the cognitive sciences more in general. The argument goes that we have relied almost exclusively on a narrow type of individual embedded in a very special class of society. Societies that are Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, which are better known by the acronym WEIRD. More specifically, many of our generalizations about the human mind have been derived from and tested in young psychology undergrads from universities in rich countries, which one could argue it's not a very representative sample of the world's population. Now, when data for all the societies and individuals are available, we typically see important differences across cognitive domains that until now have been overlooked. Now, a comparable problem is found in the study of languages. Most linguistic generalizations are based on an extremely small set of languages. To give you one very famous example, Joseph Greenberg in the 60s wrote a very influential book where he attempted to identify patterns that hold true for all languages, better known as language universals. I'm sure you have heard of them. This was a very bold move, given that he only analyzed 30 languages, which is about 0.04% of the world's attested linguistic diversity. So the last 50 years have seen again and again the same thing. Newly documented languages from the Amazon, from New Guinea, the Himalayas, etc., falsifying each and every single universal that has been proposed. Now, in spite of this, and in spite of all of the documentation that goes on, most of the theorizing about language and the priorities in language research are still monopolized by research on English and a few other languages. So my main research problem is a natural consequence of these two biases. Undersampling the wealth of languages, societies, and individuals has precluded us from understanding how important linguistic diversity is for human nature. So historically, the emphasis has been on those aspects that all languages have in common, but the fact that different populations and individuals use different languages is a tremendously important observation with many, many downstream consequences. So of course, this is a very broad problem and question, and because of that, I use different types of data and methods in collaboration most of the time with experts from across the sciences and the humanities. And I try to investigate as many languages from different regions of the world as possible. Now, there's a lot of things I do in this research line. More recently though, I became interested in the real world consequences of neglecting linguistic diversity. So in particular, if you do any work on that sector, please reach out. I would love to tell you about all of these different projects that involve different disciplines. Um, you can check my publications, Google Scholar for instance, but I would need way more than a lecture to do so. Um, plus, I wanted to stick with content I could discuss without much technicalities. I'm not going to assume that you know lots about linguistics or anthropology or human history, because I know that the audience is extremely broad and diverse, and I really don't want to, uh, uh, to make this very hard for, for most people. Okay, so today I'm going to be focusing on the relation between human history and linguistic diversity. Um, and we can start with a very simple motivating question that has been asked again and again. What explains the cross-linguistic frequency of different language structures? And just to be clear, when I say language structure, this is a cumbersome way of saying anything that belongs to language, any part of the morphology, syntax, pragmatics, etc. From the get-go, it is important to make a distinction here. There are two types of processes that shape language distributions true linguistic biases, which are tendencies and pressures that shape languages that have to do directly with language structure. And on the other hand, sheer human history. Let's be a bit more clear about what I mean here. Let's consider this hypothetical case. 
There are orange languages, which are represented with the circles and which are, happen to be way more frequent than the green languages. So how could human history account for this? Well, let's say that we start with a bunch of green and orange languages, and there's as many green as orange languages. No tendency favoring either green or orange, as you can see very clearly. But then the population of one of the orange languages grows a lot, for instance, because their users develop agriculture or animal domestication or some type of technology that allows them to expand. Then sometime after that, this lucky orange language has diversified into many languages so that now in present time, we see a tendency for languages to be orange. So we go from the same preference for, or the same tendency towards uh, green and orange to a clear prevalence of orange languages. There's many other ways in which this could happen. So let's go back to the example I just gave. Uh, let's say that the orange language undergo these developments like agriculture or domestication, etc. Another thing that could happen is that these developments allow this language to influence other languages, changing them in the process of language contact. So again, in the end, we end up with more orange than green languages, not because of the languages per se, there's nothing special about orange languages, but because of the historical factors that drive the populations that use those languages. As you know very well, in the study of language, most people ultimately don't care about human history. In particular, those who are closer to the cognitive sciences, psychology, neurosciences, and formal linguistic theory. They try to find ways to go around that so that they can explore the real linguistic biases that shape language distributions. Perhaps a more colorful way of putting this is that we want to find out true linguistic biases that will still be true if history had panned out differently. So for instance, if Hannibal had gotten into Rome successfully, probably Europe would have been populated by Semitic languages rather than in European languages. But we think that the true linguistic biases would have been the same no matter what. And that those linguistic biases are important for making sense of language distributions. So how do we discover and how do we test these linguistic biases? Now, by and far, the most common approach is what I call naive functionalism. I don't think anyone has spelled out this program as I'll be doing it here, but what I'm defining here is really nothing that it's crazy that you haven't encountered before. The main point essentially is that we can uncover linguistic biases by looking not at languages themselves, but instead at humans dealing with language or language-like material. Linguistic traits are, are acquired, process, use, conventionalized, et cetera, more efficiently by individuals will end up more frequently in what you see in real languages. So let's spell out a little bit more this template for uh, conducting naive functional experiments. It goes a bit like this. So first, and I hope unsurprisingly, you need to get people, you need to recruit people. Now, I have to add this as a side comment. Alternatively, you can study entities that we suspect do things that are similar to humans. So for instance, these days, there's a, a lot of research on the human-like production of text by deep neural models. So people are asking questions about how languages are where they are, but not by looking at humans, but by looking at, at, at these networks. But for this time, let's not make things complicated and let's just stick with good old humans for the time being. Now, second step is that you expose these people to learning, using, processing, or conventionalizing different language types. So for instance, you can have some people learning a language that is verb initial and another group learning a language that is not verb initial. Here as well, people have utilized alternatives to natural languages because of course it's hard and it takes a long time for people to acquire natural languages. So many researchers have resorted to artificial languages or grammars, which they can teach and test within a few hours. And finally, and this is the crucial point, you analyze the output of the exposure. Do we find any observable preferences for a particular language type? And you can measure this in any way you wish, depending on your research question. So you could get uh, your piece, reaction times, lexical recall, production, et cetera, et cetera. An important thing is that you see what happens after you give humans 
this language or language-like material. Now, if this works, if we can just look at the preferences that humans have, um, and on the basis of those, make predictions about the languages, then this is a solution to the problem I've posed before. Uh, because what I'm saying is that if whatever individual um, information we have, whatever information about language we have individuals, uh, then that's, that's the only thing we need. So we can just run an experiment and forget about the messy, complicated and convoluted human history. Just throw that and just focus to, to those um, experiments that we can control with a full precision, which is the ones that involve individual humans and the preferences. But of course, um, you know the title of my talk. Um, um, so what if now we go back and take a good look at human history to see whether the assumptions of the naive functional model are sound at all. So for the rest of the talk, I'll be telling you about a handful of case studies that go in that direction. Now let's start from the very beginning. How sound is the idea that linguistic biases can be identified in humans here and now? Now, in order to see where I'm going with this, we have to consider that most of contemporary linguistic diversity is fairly recent. There are exceptions, of course, but most of the largest language families are the result of large scale demographic processes within the most recent half of the Holocene. So we're talking about roughly the last 6,000 years or so. And this is particularly important because the period that gave us contemporary linguistic diversity has also been the most eventful in the history of our species. We went from small forager bands to increasingly larger populations, thanks essentially to the domestication of plants and animals, and these aggregations of, of people uh, led to more hierarchical and unequal societies, as well as specialized occupations and a whole new modality of communication, which is writing. The very psychological composition of individuals change apparently to allow for frequent interactions with non-kin individuals. And even our genome is a testimony of an accelerated period of biological adaptation in the form of multiple genes that allow us to conquest every corner of the earth and to eat virtually every single food that we can think of. What this means is that there have been important changes in what it means to be human. So maybe our linguistic biases now are not the same they were before all of these important processes. So let me expand um, a bit, little bit more one particular case study, which is based on our 2019 paper that we published in Science. In this paper, we look into labidental sounds. This is the speech sounds that result from phoning while making your lower lips make contact with your upper teeth. So in English, you have two labidentals, F, and V. And I think in Portuguese, I'm sure at least you have one, uh, farofa, feijoada, but um, probably you have two as well. And most varieties of my native language, you just have a single labidental. But in any case, uh, having a labidental is not a very infrequent thing because about half of all languages that have been described have at least one labidental. So this is not a very interesting speech sound because it's very frequent. Now, the starting point of my observation is that um, we have to concentrate on the paleoanthropology of the bite. What we observe is that in most contemporary adults, the upper teeth forms an angle with respect to the lower teeth and that the upper and lower teeth are not aligned. So this is the uh, so-called overbite and overjet. Uh, the majority of humans that exist now have this particular bite configuration. Um, in contrast, um, teeth of pre-Holocene populations, as well as many ethnographic hunter-gatherer groups, display a different bite in adulthood. More specifically, the upper teeth are upright, there are no cusps, and the upper and lower teeth form a perfect occlusion. Now, the evidence suggests that the transition between this type of bite to the contemporary one was driven by changes in diet-related wear, brought by agriculture, cooking techniques, and finally, extensive food preprocessing. The edge to edge bite results from exposure to heavy wear over the course of development. So what this means essentially is that most children have overbite and overjet, but if they are exposed to a heavy wear diet by puberty, they'll start showing an edge to edge bite. 
Now, this change intuitively modified the production cost of labirintals. And this is very easy for, for you to, to check. Uh, um, so labirintals are easy for contemporary humans because we only need to move slightly the lower lip in order to produce them. It's extremely easy articulation. Now, if you had edge to edge bite, then you'll have to move your lower lips inside of your vocal chamber, which is quite cumbersome if you try it. But you know, this is just an intuition that tells us that maybe back in the past, it was harder to produce um, labyrinthals. Can we actually test this? So we evaluated our intuitions on the articulatory cost of labyrinthals. And we use this model, which is a model of a human face based on finite elements. Um, and there is, you can see a number of reference points that capture the differential work done by each of the facial muscles. And as I said, you, know, you can see in this video there are small cyan dots there. Those are the points where we're measuring the cost of, doing, of producing different articulations. So what we do then is we simulate the production of labyrinthals in the two byte configurations. And I'm going to show you right now, there you go. And then we obtain the differential costs incurred by each individual muscle. And aggregating across all muscles, labyrinthals are 40% more costly in the edge to edge condition, the original condition. So in particular, what we find is that the muscles are responsible for the fine motor control of the lips, like the lip riser and the zygomatic are the ones that show the largest difference between bite configurations, which is what we expected because we think, well, it's very hard to move our lips inside and the muscles uh, that involved in that movement are the ones that are going to show the most difference in effort. And this is exactly what we find. Now we can ask, can we actually observe an association between labyrinthals and bite? And the answer is we can't because as I said before, most human populations now have all right and overjet. But at least we can see whether there is any association between the typical diet of these populations back in the day. And when I say this, I'm talking about ethnographic timescale. So perhaps 200 years back, and the presence of labyrinthals. And what we find is that food producing societies, which are often exposed to soft diets and hunter gatherers, which are typically exposed to heavy wear diets have different rates of labyrinthals. In our 2000 languages, we find that still today, we can see the consequences of the past in how languages look today. Now, in particular, we see the regions of the world that have been historically the homeland of hunter gatherer groups like Greenland, Southern Africa, and Australia, either do not have labyrinthals at all, or when they do, they have them, they are present only because of recent borrowings that come from interaction with European languages or other food producing societies like the Bantu in Southern Africa. So this is particularly telling um, in the case of the Khoisan languages in Southern Africa, because these are the ones with the largest number of distinct speech sounds. So finding that they do not have what it is otherwise a very common speech sound is very, very telling. But then we can ask, do these patterns that we find across the world do they reflect anything that we know about history? So we have one very well-studied case, which is the Indo-European language family. This family is about 8,000 years old, but it was well after it spread over Eurasia that Indo-European people gained access to soft foods. So the important point here is that we don't expect the labyrinthals existed in the early stages of the European. Now, of course, uh, the first European language has not survived until today, but we can attempt to reconstruct what some of its words sounded like by looking at the set of words in contemporary Indo-European languages that descend directly, or that we think that descend directly from the vocabulary of this first language. Now, in this slide, you can see one particular example, which is the set of words that refer to father. As you can see, some of those words have a labyrinthal, like in English, again, father, whereas others do not, as in the case of Spanish, padre. We call the set of words cognate sets. So we plug in this information into the tree that represents the history of European. What you can see here is that the tree in the father cognate set uh, shows in blue tips uh, absence of labyrinthals and red tips presence of labyrinthals. So we do essentially, starting from the tips, which is the only thing we can observe, languages that we have documented, 
um, we apply standard phylogenetic techniques and we estimate whether early Indo-European languages have lividentals. And that is a small pie chart signal with the arrow in the, in the graphic. As you see, most of the pie is blue, which means we think likely there were no lividentals at that stage, but maybe we were just lucky by choosing this particular cognate set. So we repeated this experiment with 10 very different cognate sets and we find the same picture. None of these tests suggest lividentals could be found at the beginning of the family as we predicted. Even more, the rise of probability in lividentals in these trees suggests they only became frequent within the last two to 3,000 years uh, in European groups, which is not so long after cereals and their products became staple foods in these societies. So it really matches the, the story that we have for this. Now, I bet that some of you might be a bit lost at this point, asking what this has to do with this with anything. So let me recap a little bit. We show that labidentals, which are very frequent in contemporary languages, are likely the result of a change in the bite and the diet of humans around the world in the last few thousand years. Now, this functional pressure cannot be detected if we only look at humans that exist today because most people have overbite and overjet, which raises the question, how many other important factors we might be missing by only focusing on humans that exist here and now. But more in general, let's go back to the, the, the big picture question. How true is that humans are actively shaping languages in a long lasting manner? Now, to start with, it does not take a lot of input and not even directed input for children to acquire very complex languages. Like for instance, in this naturalistic study of children learning Tzeltal. Now Tzeltal, it's a morphologically complex ergative language, has a lot of things that most languages will consider are very complicated. And you know, these children receive no lot of input and they still are able to come up with the adult version of the language at the end of this process. So, it's no surprise, but every neurotypical child ends up acquiring the language of their community, no matter how complicated it is, of course. But there's something even more interesting here. You see, there are these uh, this real world circumstances where we see that learning a given language is comparatively harder than learning another yeah, similar language. So the example uh, you see in the screen is from the Puzzle of Danish project, which has been going for some time now and has revealed lots of interesting things about this and related languages. So Danish has a very complex vowel space, as you can see in the figure on the, on the left. Uh, so you have all these vowels that are crowded close to each other. Uh, and it does seem that children take a long time to figure out what's going on, which you, know, you can blame them for that. So when we compare Danish to most other European languages, there is a clearly detectable gap in, for instance, the number of words they know at around the year mark. So there is a difference. And for them, it takes longer to acquire vocabulary, perhaps because of the complexity of the vowel space. Now, in spite of this, in spite of this very clear difference in learnability, there is no evidence for Danish uh, becoming more simple to allow for enhanced learnability. So even if it takes a little bit longer, children keep learning the language and the language doesn't seem to be changing in any direction that will facilitate this. So upon reflection though, this is not necessarily a very surprising thing. So small children and babies do change the input they receive. We know this very well. They overgeneralize, they omit some things, et cetera. But that is not important because they'll keep receiving input through development. So by the time they become full-fledged adults, they'll be aligned to the language they were taught. So those biases that you see early on do not get to change language. The ideal and highly unethical experiment here will be to see what happens when the input that children receive is insufficient so that they are stuck, so to speak, with the biases they show when learning language. Um, for the 80s kids out there, one possibility could be a blue lagoon type of situation. I'm not going to tell you about the plot. I don't remember the plot myself, but you know, in that movie that was fairly cheesy, there were these two kids that were age seven and nine that ended up stranded in an island alone. 
So they have to do with whatever English they learned before. And if I recall correctly, in the movie, they keep an infantile register of language even when they grow up, which I think makes sense because they never become acquainted with the language of the adults uh, directly. So I don't know whether we have any good real Blue Lagoon case attested in the literature, but let me know in the comments if you know about any such case. I will be very interested in knowing that. However, there is a real world case scenario that involves very limited and noisy input. And these are the Creole languages. So Creole languages emerge in highly multilingual societies where different groups of people do not share a common language. Historically common setups for Creoles have been slaveries, maroon communities, and trade posts, among a few other, other situations. So the children of these people grow up together, and in many circumstances, they do not receive a direct instruction in any specific language. So they're just passively exposed to the surrounding languages and the basic communication code adults use. And I'll go back to that a little bit later. Um, but these children, as they become adults, they will develop a full new language, which is a Creole language. Now, very early, researchers notice that Creoles around the world seem to be quite different from non-Creoles. This fueled the notion of the Creole exceptionalism hypothesis, which suggests Creoles are unique because they undergo a transmission bottleneck. And this is a crucial phrase, transmission bottleneck. Now, of course, as I said, I'm letting all the technical details aside, but simplifying, this is how the hypothesis goes, more or less. We start, as I said, with at least two mutually intelligible languages spoken in the context of the Creole genesis. There could be many more languages than two. So for instance, in the sugarcane plantations in Hawaii in the late, the late 19th century, uh, one could find speakers of languages from Europe, from the Americas, Eastern Asia, the Pacific, and Southeast Asia, sometimes all within the same community. So there could be more, many more than just two languages uh, um, at the time of the Creole Genesis. Now, these people, they need to communicate with each other and they develop a pidgin based mostly on words and expressions of the dominant language, which is often the European language in the case of colonial setups. Now, a pidgin, most people would not agree on that these are full uh, natural languages. It is, pidgins are mostly made up of fixed expressions with limited productivity and with a narrow scope. So you can, you can use a pitching to talk about everything. Uh, instead, they seem to be tied to specific functional context. So this, the rise of a pitching is a transmission bottleneck because the pitching is unable to preserve the properties that make a language a language. It's syntax, morphology, semantics. So you have all these different languages and then the pitching comes, which is the communication code, but the pitching cannot preserve the features of the languages that came before it. Now, finally, what happens is that this pidgin is acquired by local children and is transformed into a, a full natural language, which is again, the Creole language. And because the pidgin threw away all of the complex parts of the grammar, as I mentioned before, and according to this hypothesis, they have to invent the language themselves. So that's why all Creole languages are similar because they depend on solving the same issue, which is to create a language from scratch. But is this what actually happened? So in 2017, me and my collaborators provided an empirical test of this hypothesis. We took a lot of data covering as many creoles as we could find um, that you can see in the map as blue dots. And we also have a curated set of non-creole languages, the red dots that, that we could use to compare uh, both set of languages. Now, this is a little bit how the data look like. For each language, we have its status, whether it is a Creole or not. And then we have a number of linguistic features, many of which have been discussed in the Creole literature as indicators of Creoleness. So we have presence of tones, basic word order of language, whether there's grammatical gender, and along, etc. So with this data, we can test the first half of the hypothesis. Can we discriminate Creoles from non-Creoles based solely on grammatical structure. Just by looking at the grammar, can we tell which language is a Creole and which language is not a Creole? And the answer is yes. Creoles stand out as a distinguishable group on the basis of the linguistic structure. We can take a look at the grammar and have a very fair guess if a language is a Creole or not. 
But then we give a closer inspection of the emerging patterns. And this is when things get interesting because um, we find that there are some creels that are systematically misclassified as non creels. And these are usually found far from the Caribbean and the principal European colonial routes. But then when we look at non creels that are misclassified as creels, we find something pretty suspicious, which is languages like English and Spanish or Yoruba, which is a major West African language. Even more, the features that better allow us to distinguish creoles from non-creoles, the grammatical features that better allow you to distinguish creoles from non-creoles are features that are found prominently in Europe and West Africa. So you see what's going on here. The reason why creoles seem to form a consistent group should be very clear at this point. They simply reflect the fact that most creoles emerged in colonial setups in the last 500 years by Western European powers based on enslaved people from West Africa. So the creole languages that resulted from these circumstances are a consistent group of languages in the same way, say, Romans or Germanic languages are because they share a common history, they have the same ancestry, and not because they are coming up with a full new language from scratch. So this finding makes the transmission bottleneck idea completely unnecessary, which is actually consistent with the fact that for the overwhelming majority of creoles, we don't have any trace of a pre-existent pidgin. Now, if the accounts we receive are accurate, the children that started the creole did not benefit from any directed instruction. As I told you before, they were sometimes even forced to work and in general, they would suit horrible upbringing circumstances. Now, in spite of all of this, they nevertheless managed to learn extremely complex language structures from the languages around them. So let's wrap up a little bit. And I realized that I went very quickly. Uh, I, now I, I regret removing so much material. Anyhow, now we will all be able to watch the match in time and we won't be missing the first time then. So, as I said, let's summarize a little bit uh, what I have shown you. First of all, it's clear that some important large scale aspects of, langu of languages of the world, these are the product of functional pressures that we, we cannot observe anymore. So if we think that we can find out why languages are the way they are just by looking at humans here and now, you're wrong. And as I said, the last 6,000 years have been extremely eventful. So many things about humans have changed. And I think it's about time for us to start thinking what other possible important changes might have occurred in language because of this uh, late Holocene transition I talked about before. Second point is that in extreme circumstances of language use and language acquisition, languages do not seem to be actively shaped by new biases. It is not the case that um, because languages become a bit harder to learn or because uh, humans receive noisy and limited input, then they are, the humans are immediately jumping into uh, active shaping mode and they change the language they receive. Instead, it seems that language transmission is an extremely robust process. And finally, um, because of the robustness of this process, because really once language is attached to humans, it's extremely, extremely sticky. Um, the important thing is that um, the structure of languages ends up accumulating a lot of different bits and pieces that reflect their previous interaction, perhaps with other languages. And I didn't talk much about language contact, but language contact is the most important factor explaining why languages end up having the, the structure they have in many, many cases that we study. So all of this, to my mind, support the notion that linguistic biases are regularly overridden by human history and that the na naive functional model that I presented before is, well, naive. So languages cannot be reduced to humans. Languages last much longer, they're very resilient, and they're very useful even if they are not optimal for the needs of individuals that use them. And I'm sure many of you are thinking about this. Uh, are there any true functional pressures shaping languages at all? And, and of course, I, I'd say in many respects, I, I feel myself, um, I, I think I'm a, I'm a functionalist. I'm convinced that uh, communication, memory, learnability, production cost, social indexation, and a large, large, et cetera, and all of these things have something to say 
about the structure of language. But to my mind, they surely help us think about the basic architecture all languages should share. But what I'm not convinced about is that these factors are important for explaining the linguistic diversity we observe. So they might tell you something about things that you expect to find across all languages, but I'm not sure whether they're useful for explaining linguistic diversity. And, and lastly, I would like to come full circle. What does anything of this I have been telling you have to do with what I said at the beginning that you know, linguistic diversity is underrated, yada, yada. Well, you see, one of the unintended consequences of the naive functional model is that we can learn all what needs to be learned about linguistic biases in a well-equipped laboratory anywhere in the world. Now, as it happens, that means that a lot of the science produced in this respect is based in developed countries in the West, because why not? If, if it's the same, taking any human and doing the same experiment you know, in the United States, in, in Egypt or, or, or Cambodia, then just, just go ahead and run it where, wherever you are. And most people and most research money is, as we know, uh, very skewly distributed. So the arguments I gave you before against the naive functionalist uh, approach are based on factual observations. And ultimately, like everyone else, what I want to do is to find out what's going on with linguistic diversity. However, I find important to stress that if you agree with me, there's no way around. And the only way of learning about linguistic biases is embracing languages of the world with the users and histories at full. And with that, I will resume a very brief talk. Thanks so much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Damien, for this great talk. For the record, I love farofa, egg farofa, banana farofa, even water farofa. And it is hard to produce a lava dental while eating farofa. <laughs> <laughs> now, we will start the discussion session with invited discussion, discussion Caius Sinemaki, Associate Professor in the Department of Language and General Linguistics at the University of Helsinki. Thanks, Dr. Sinemaki, for accepting our invitation, even though it's the middle of the night to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for the invitation of being a discussant uh, with Damien. And this late hour doesn't really matter me being quite a night owl sometimes myself. These late night hours are sometimes the most productive times, but not always so good for the family. Uh, thank you, Damien, for the very interesting talk, which raises many, many, many interesting questions, of course. and. Um, um, I also see your talk as a way of, because my background is largely in, well, my background is in general linguistics, but in general linguistics, I have been focusing a lot on language typology, so the worldwide wide comparison of languages. So I, I see your talk as a very welcome uh, call for taking seriously. Uh, comparative linguistic work, whether done by typologists or historical linguists. Uh, so this is this is very welcome. Thank you, Damien, for this. Um, I think I would like to start with um, maybe going back to your uh, claim about naive functionalism. Uh, so I, I'm directly diving into what what you were you were uh, saying. Um, I was just wondering about naive functionalism in the sense that when uh, we do experimental studies, for instance, using artificial language learning experiments, where we teach these small artificial uh, language systems to the participants and, and then see how they evolve. Uh, can't these sorts of approaches be remedied in any way? For instance, by um, 
having more diverse um, um, set of participants. For instance, uh, with various different native languages and these sorts of things. Uh, I, I sort of know and expect what you are going to answer, but but still, um, I think this is this is uh, sort of a relevant start for this. Well, thanks so much. I, I think I agree with you. I think it's a very interesting question. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you know that Jennifer Corbiston has been doing a lot of research with languages other than English, uh, running the same uh, uh, artificial language tasks with people that have different native languages. And, and it's sometimes they do similar things, sometimes they do different things. So I think this is an extremely important uh, um, um, step forward. Now, what I would say is that um, there's, there's, there are many things that one could say about this tradition of research, and I would put those um, criticisms or limitations in two categories. One has to do with the fact that, of course, it's artificial language. So all of these questions about ecological validity arise. Um, is it, it doesn't matter that this is a system that you just learn in a laboratory, perhaps within a few hours, and you know, you know that you are doing a task because you're invited to a, a laboratory for doing something, you don't know what, but you know, you already have a native language. Um, then this is a language that you know, don't get to use in naturalistic circumstances and stuff like that. So I think there are many questions um, about like why this is telling us something about language and, and not just general rule making uh, systems. Uh, but let's say that we could solve that, right? Let's say that we could add enough uh, naturalistic uh, contexts for us to get there. And the question will still remain is like, is, is this what actual humans are doing? Now, what I find in many of these publications is that, um, so, okay, let, let's rewind a little bit. Why are we doing some of these things? Why are we running this type of experiments? Because as we know, just looking at languages of the world is very messy. So if we say, you know, there is a preference for, you know, not having uh, definite articles in language of the world, then people will say, well, but maybe you're just forgetting about this contact event or, you know, so there is, there is it's extremely hard to make taxative claims about um, tendencies in languages that are purely linguistic on the basis of just language data, as you know very well. But then in this, in this papers, in the studies that where they look into artificial languages, artificial grammars, in the end, they end up going to those results. So, you know, and this is where the situation is a bit complicated, but let's say that you find that, you know, all human observed languages do A or they don't do A, and then the experiment shows the same thing, right? The artificial language shows the same thing. Then that's very good. Maybe they are telling the same story. Although we have to keep in mind that finding the same pattern doesn't mean that this is the right mechanism. So think, for instance, about Sip's law, right? This uh, well-known relation that the frequency of a word uh, decreases with the rank of the word in, in, a, in a given corpus. That's a very terrible way of describing it. But um, I, I say that there are at least 20 different models that produce the same pattern, and they are all equally motivated, um, you know, mentioning some aspect of, of language production. So the fact that we can find a pattern that is reflecting the languages of the world is not enough. But I think the most critical situation is what happens when they don't? What if you run an experiment and you find the languages do something else? So either the experiment is wrong and then you're not learning something about languages or it is right, but then that thing, that bias doesn't matter. And then other aspects of linguistic, linguistic biases and, and human history end up overriding uh, this tendency. Um, and if you're in between, say, let's say that you find some that you, you sort of get the same frequencies for say OV and VO languages, or object verb and verb object languages that depending on how you count, you might get slightly more languages RVO than OV or the other way around. So that, that, that's the thing. What does it mean to match that pattern there? So I think that these methods, they want to go away from human languages and they're doing amazing, they are providing amazing observations of what's going on. But in the end, they are tied to that. So they go back exactly to what we see in languages of the world. So they fall into the same problems that, that, that typologies uh, encounter, so. Yeah, thanks. This, this, is, this is very good, very good response. And um, it sort of draws um, attention back to the point you made, made in relation to the labiodental paper 
that we actually have to look at history and we have to look at the history of, of uh, languages and language families and the history of linguistic diversity as well. Um, one sort of general question may arise from, from um, what you mentioned about biases perhaps being different in earlier populations compared to populations at the moment. And in, in that, that sense, we need to take some stance to the uniformitarian hypothesis that where the processes of language change similar in the past than they are, they are currently. Um, there's a sort of general question that I've been thinking related to this that, and it's, it's a little bit nasty question, <laughs> that doesn't this in a sense open a little bit of a Pandora's box that about the diversity of us as humans. Uh, you refer, I think, um, like if, if we think about linguistics in early 20th, up until early 20th century, uh, they were quite uh, strong and taken for granted assumptions that uh, European civilized languages are sort of top of the cream, like they are the best. And then uh, other languages, especially those spoken by minority groups, for instance, in the rainforest, uh, they are simple languages spoken by simple, mm -hmm. uncivilized, uh, maybe cognitively uh, um, different kind of yep. people. So, um, Yeah, I, I think I, I would like to just hear your response on that, that when, when we take diversity seriously, are we not sort of tapping that question, um, yes. whether we want or not? Yes, I think you are absolutely right. And I appreciate So the, the, the back of the, um, so I had planned a much longer presentation where I, talk, I touch upon many different things, but then I, um, I, you know, I learned about the match and everything. I felt okay. I don't want to impose to people for so long. And then, you know, you're in Finland. It's pretty late. So I thought I'm going to, but that was one of the points that I, that I uh, remove in a rush, which I think I shouldn't have. And I think this is an extremely important thing that we should be discussing. So what you're saying is absolutely correct. When, when the first awareness of, I mean, one could go to, uh, you know, Humboldt, for instance, uh, and then, you know, the, the, all those people where the awareness of linguistic diversity came with a clear notion of superiority. It's like, well, you know, uh, only the languages that have case marking are good for thinking. The languages that don't have case marking, they're absolutely, you know, in spite of the fact that you have the Chinese going on and producing philosophy, whatever. anyhow. So there is this, this initial position where the differences were associated directly with the difference in quality or dignity. And then this weird thing happened, which is we said, well, let's, let's focus instead on those things that all languages have in common, let's do that. But what ended up happening in the end, and this is something I, I, I was pointing out, is that by doing that, essentially they say, well, you know, everything's the same, then there's, there's nothing about going to exotic languages because they are all essentially the same. So let's just forget about those. And what they have done essentially is that they, they have disregarded a lot of interesting linguistic and cultural phenomena from other populations uh, that now uh, are, have fallen outside of the uh, production of linguistic theory. And we're talking about linguistics only here. Um, so I think that the evidence that there are differences across human populations in, in small differences in, in attention patterns, in color naming, in, those are overwhelming. But now the, the, the motivation, uh, so first of all, most of these things are very small. Second, these differences are not a difference in terms of, of quality. Uh, it, it's very funny because um, with the Levidental paper, what happens is there has been a change in bite, right? And one could say, well, you know, maybe you're saying, you know, there's something about the biology of humans that have changed. 
So the levin Intel change, as I mentioned, is not a genetic, it's not, it's not really right genetic change, it's just something about the diet you eat. But the interesting thing is that the, the best, if we have to say the functionally best configuration is not the one that we had. And you know, we have cavities, we get stuff stuck in our teeth because most humans, most animal species end up privileging uh, um, edge to edge bite because there is a number of, pro so, you know, it's essentially the older bite, the one that was the good and we have the bad one. So in that case where we can identify certain value it's actually us that got the, the, the shorter side of the stick. Um, yeah, um, but I think also, and I think here you and I, we stand in, in different positions and I know some people in the audience might, know, might not know about this, but um, I, I try to steer away from the notion of complexity, which I think it's a big trap, right? So I, I think that, that talking about complexity is, it never ends well because I, I think it opens a back door for people to use their own prejudice about what's important and what, you know, I, I, I just, um, and I think when we remove those, when we remove, remove the terms that are associated with, uh, or that have um, this uh, leftover flavor from uh, uh, gone, bygone theories of linguistic and human diversity, then I think we are, we are on safe, on safe ground. And I say, as I said, I think the important thing here is we should stress diversity because different languages, different cultures are actually different. So uh, if we don't do that, we, we perpetuate this situation, which is that most of what we are told that is the science of human mind and behavior, et cetera, is done in a couple of countries with a very, very narrow type of individual. So that's what I would say. Very long answer. Sorry for that. <laughs> no, no problem. No problem at all. And and this this again draws draws attention to the to the fact that that we actually need to look at various different types of languages in order to um, not just understand linguistic diversity but to test our theories about how language works and and uh, our theories about language more generally. Um, you mentioned now that you started mentioning more about the labian and salt. Paper. I think I would like to go back to that case study. And, okay. um, Sorry about that. Uh, all right. Um, okay. Yes. Um, if we think about the edge to edge bytes and then the overjets over bytes configurations. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like the edge to edge byte functions as some kind of uh, like pushing the brake to labiodental to labiodentals developing in a sense. And once you tail, once the brakes are not no longer there, then uh, labiodentals can start developing here and there and, and spreading throughout the language population if we think about languages as, as, as uh, populations. Um, what do you think this tells about who drives language change or who may prohibit language change? Like there, we, we know that there are different theories about that, that it's, it's children who primarily drive language change versus it's adults who primarily drives language change. So um, do you see your, your paper um, relating to that and providing answers to that in some ways? Absolutely. I think that here the implicit um, claim is that the ones that are doing the change are the adults. Why? Because you only gain edge to edge bite after being exposed to heavy wear diet. So essentially all children have overbite and overjet. And I think this in general, this aligns to what I know about the few instances that are well described um, that involve language change and specific individuals or populations. This is a, a, a very influential idea that is children. There are children, the ones that are changing language, but I don't think we have evidence for that. And I think the reason for that is that children are isolated. They don't have a social network. They, they don't participate in the society, at least given the most frequent configurations that we get from, from ethnography. 
So it's only when you become a part of your society that you have some type of agency to change stuff. But you know, if you're a baby and you're doing something and you might be cute, we might adopt some of your uh, nursery names or something, but I, I don't think um, that, that that's what, what happens. Yeah, that's, that's basically how I understood the paper also, that it's, it's basically adults who develop the, the H2H bites and they, they are sort of the ones who push the brakes on labiodentals in a sense. And, exactly. And, uh, yeah. There is a more, there is, um, I know perhaps this is not the intended answer that you had for that question as well, but there is another type of answer to what you are thinking about, which is you know, who, who within the population do this? And it's, uh, as I said, it's very speculative, so I'm not going to put this forward as a claim, but it's very interesting to see that the, the access to soft food wasn't equally uh, structured for all the members of population. So, you know, you're dealing with these agricultural societies where inequality seems to be the norm. And then it's a few people who start getting the, the good soft food and the others do not. So one could even speculate that it might have been served as a marker for social statues or something like that. Um, but, you know, that, that's in the realm of speculation. That's very that's very interesting, but it also draws draws more attention. Well, the way I see it, it draws more attention to to the fact that we actually need to do um, sociolinguistic and anthropological studies on um, these sorts of societies. That who who, um, if there is any soft food available, who gets to eat it, or if it's pre like um, if it's um, sort of a valued item in at all to begin with. Okay, but um, this, this is going now <laughs> more into details and not too technical though, but um, I think there is, there is room for a little bit speculation also in terms of um, your model where you, your idea is that this, this byte configuration when changing from edge edge to edge to over jet over bite provides more room for labia dentals. But can we turn it around a little bit by focusing on these populations where edge to edge bites is more common and thinking about especially the bilabial space. I think you mentioned in the paper that there's maybe just a slight, some kind of a preference, or maybe, maybe it's just a little bit easier when having edge to edge bites uh, to produce bilabials compared to um, over jet, uh, over, over bite configurations. So I'm, I'm just curious, did, did you um, like what, what your thoughts are on this or did you have a look at uh, the bilabial space? Right that do these languages uh, spoken by populations, uh, hunter-gatherer populations that uh, do not use soft diet so much, um, that do, do they uh, take use of the bilabial space more densely, for instance, than so, uh, agriculturalists? That, that, that's an excellent question. And I think, um, so to me, there's two pieces of evidence that we got in our paper that strongly suggest that uh, Levidentals might have started with bilabial fricatives, for instance, at least some a subclass of the Levidentals, which are the most common ones. And so we have this, this nice uh, um, model by, by Scott Moisick, where what we see is that um, if you try to produce a bilabial fricative, but now you have overbite, um, uh, overbite and overjet, then there is a chance that you will produce an accidental labidental. So if your language may have had that, it could be a case that you end up uh, tapping on, like producing labidentals accidentally again and again and again. And that depends on how pronounced the overbite and overjet is. Um, so, but the, the thing is that this was a, a post hoc finding and the reason why we didn't look into um, bilabials more systematically across languages of the world 
was because our original motivation was to go back to uh, Hawkett's hypothesis and Hawkett's hypothesis was about Legrental. So um, as a matter of fact, when we started this project with, with Steve Moran, um, we thought that there was nothing there. We thought this was the, like the craziest, most bollock uh, hypothesis one could put forward. It's like, what diet affecting language? And I think it was going through this process that we learned that you know um, everything goes. So, so yeah, the short answer is I, I'm absolutely sure that it's going there's some type of trade-off going on with bilabials, uh, but we haven't studied that systematically. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Looking forward to that if we are going to dig deeper into into that data. I would maybe like to go to the. Um, Questions you raised with um, with the Creole data. Uh, that's of course very very uh, strongly debated question that whether Creoles are somehow different from from non Creoles and for what reasons. To me, as a as a typologist, it's it's been very very interesting to follow this discussion and follow researchers using ever more sophisticated uh, statistical methods for doing that and ever bigger uh, data sets for, for the comparison. And it seems that whenever that happens, the same conclusion comes, that Creoles are different from non creoles And that's, of course, extremely interesting that this conclusion seems to come over and over and over again. And now, of course, there are different ways of explaining that. And like you, you draw attention to, to uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, uh, if we think about the two different camps in this debate, about the camp that uh, argues that there has been a transmission bottleneck in in uh, the development of Creoles. And this has created um, the similarities between Creoles. Um, and then there's the other, other sort of approach to that, that it's not, it doesn't have that much to do with, with tran transmission, but it actually has mostly to do with, with uh, the contributing languages, that the contributing languages are similar to one another, but they are also different from the rest of the languages in the world. Um, one thing that I've been curious in these, these studies is that very often, uh, and, and yours, yours included, take features which are sort of isolated from one another. Whereas when in typology, when we look at features, we tend to be interested in how features correlate with one another. So for instance, how different word order parameters correlate with one another, or for instance, that in verb final languages, they tend to produce, develop case more readily and SVO languages uh, tend not to develop case uh, that likely. So the, these sorts of correlations. So I would be curious to hear your opinion on that, that um, that because, because typological features are not just isolated features one, from one another, mm -hmm. but they, they, they are interconnected in, in various different ways, that shouldn't we look at that as well? Absolutely. So absolutely. I think that, so when I started working, working on Creoles, I just wanted to know what was going on, um, partially because of some of, I wouldn't call them concerns, but your observations, that is, there's a lot of people who have looked into this and, um, and it seems that it hasn't been a fair play on that different researchers look at different subsets of data. So, um, you know, there's this, this thing called the uh, cafeteria problem that was pretty famous in Creole studies, which is, you know, that, that was what the Creole exceptionalists will tell the non-Creole exceptionalists, which will say, uh, oh, you know, I find evidence there's continuity from West Africa because this one language there 
in, you know, in, in Southern Cameroon that has this property. And there's this thing here that could be derived from there and they say, well, come on, I mean, that's, that's, that's not fair. And, but I think the other way around, right? Most of the arguments that people use right now to argue for a transmission bottleneck, they have to look into specific features. And, and there is another important point that is not being discussed regularly, which is that from a typological perspective, the languages, some of the languages that give rise uh, to real languages are not morphologically very complex languages like English. So, you know, people are, you know, they keep making this point that it's a little morphology, et cetera. But, you know, if you don't have that in the languages that gave rise to the creoles, then why do you expect that, you know, languages will become, but anyhow, going to the point that you, going to your question, I think that one thing I did find extremely surprising and unexpected was this very, tight association between different aspects of grammar and the source of transmission. So what we found is that um, you, from the lexifiers, you take word order patterns. So most creoles, you replicate the word order patterns that were present in well, mostly the European languages, but also in the other lexifiers across languages of the world. At the same time, you can see some uh, evidence for phonological aspects are shared between lexifiers and the creoles, um, but that's most of the thing. It's essentially the vocabulary and word order patterns. Now, when you look at the substrates, uh, you find that there's some, so for instance, there are many um, complex constructions uh, that involve complex marking of arguments that they are clearly coming from the substrates again and again and again. There's a lot about time marking that is also taken from, or it, it, the decision is weaker, but you can still see there. There's some things you say, come on, this cannot be innovated. This clearly came from, from here. And also you find some phonology. But one thing I find extremely, extremely enticing about this whole thing is um, how um, Creole speakers, that uh, have this double heritage, which was like European languages and mostly this big West African component. They not only preserve the structure of the languages, but they might even preserve for generations the names of plants that they don't find in their continent anymore. So it might be the case that you know, after a lot of time without encountering that plant, two generations downstream, they encounter something that looks like that and they use say the Bantu name for that. So, and I keep stressing that, I think, um, Creole, the, the Creole contention to me is not so much between linguistic camps, but with the cognitive sciences, because Creoles have been used again and again for the cognitive sciences, scientists as an excuse to say, well, you know, this is exactly where the, the beauty happens. And then humans come up with their biases. And, and what you see is that that doesn't happen. There is a lot of persistence of linguistic structure, culture, behavior, music, and everything. Um, which is, I don't know, the evidence is so overwhelming, it's all over the place, but for some reason, they, you know, they haven't received the, the memo. So, sorry, that was an off point. It wasn't what you were asking, but you know, that's what I'm saying, which is even in creogenesis, we find strong associations between features again and again. So. Yeah, thanks for that. This is one reason why I'm, why I'm drawing attention to this is that if we think about, like you mentioned, that many of the lexifier languages were, honestly speaking, are and have not been so uh, complex inflectionally. Um, if we think about, for instance, English and some other languages um, like like English, uh, which actually have also been um, sometimes claimed to be a Creole. Mm -hmm. But um, if we think about, for instance, English, it's an SVO language also. It has... Um, lost case marking to a large degree. It still has vestiges of, of case marking, but sort of a natural path for an SVO language, if it has had case marking, is in the end to lose case marking. And maybe in the Creole formation process, that process is just, um, uh, made quicker in a way. Okay, but but uh, we don't have to delve into that more. And um, I'm also aware of the time and of, of the Brazil, Brazil uh, uh, 
football match. So I only have one one more question, which is um, sort of takes this discussion into a little bit different, but also a little bit more personal direction in the sense that, uh, Damien, your background in your undergrad studies is, is physics, if, I, if I'm correct, but you have um, turn, turned more into uh, computer science, data science, linguistics, uh, cognitive science, anthropology. Um, what sorts of, if we think about people listening to your talk and following your career and your publications, and we today now heard you calling for people to take history seriously. Um, what would you have to say for, for instance, undergrad students who are li listening to, to you about your journey? Well, yeah, it, it is it is a, a personal uh, a question. I'm, I'm happy to, to talk about that. Um, you, you are correct. I My background is in physics. I did my PhD in computer sciences, and I spent the last 10 years in departments of anthropology, cognitive sciences, comparative linguistics, uh, bioinformatics, human evolutionary biology, data science, whatever. And, and for me, it has been great fun. And perhaps, and because of the sheer amount of knowledge uh, that I acquire um, and how much my worldview has changed. So when I started working on language uh, already a decade ago, I, I, had, I, I was super naive about um, you know, linguistic diversity and history. And I just wanted to derive everything from, from first principles and nice equations and use the best possible physics metaphor for stuff. And it was just an accident that I ended up reading my first grammar without me even wanting to. Uh, and I thought, you know, the first time I, I sat through um, um, a typology talk, I thought it was the most boring thing I have ever encountered. And I felt like, why, why people describe those things? Why did you even, you know, I care about language. I don't care about these small things. But then I realized that that's, that's a real thing. And, and there is clearly a marketing problem and, uh, you know, we still, um, I, I think that comparative linguistics, historical linguistics, field workers, people working in documentation, multilingualism, et cetera, those people are criminally underrated because there is a, a, a methodological fetish that we have. And this also touches my presentation because, you know, being able to do an experiment is accommodating to the gold standard of, of experimental science and you know good science. This is, this, is, this is how science is done. But in, in our case study, we have to keep in mind that you know, possibly we cannot do the experiments that we need. So either you cope with what we have or you don't know anything about that. So now when it comes to the undergrads, for if you're still here and you're not watching the match, um, then what I have to say is um, a couple of things. First, don't, don't do what I did, which is, uh, it was great. I learned lots. I think I'm in a very privileged position because you know, I interact between disciplines that do not usually talk with each other, but um, you know, it's unclear whether I will have um, the, the place I will need to in the future for doing science because um, you know, everyone loves people who are interdisciplinary when they're PhD students or postdocs, but when you have to become a faculty, you know, you become a faculty usually to a department. So if you go to a linguistics department or an anthropology department or a cognitive science department, or data science department, and you say, look, I've been working on all these things because my object of study doesn't care about departmental divisions. It's language and language is naturally complex and it's across, then they will say, fine, that's amazing. But you know, we need someone who has a track record on any of these things. So my advice is that if you find any of these things interesting, Please, and if you want to stay in academia, which is another big if, make sure that you get the credentials of one of these fields so that people can recognize you. They will say, oh, you know, you have publications in, in, in a particular field and people know who you are. You speak the jargon of that uh, discipline and people know you. Otherwise, it's a, an extremely frustrating experience. Um, and it, you know, I, I think this is one of the saddest discoveries in, in in the scientific circuit, which is, it's not only about yourself, about how much you can do, it's also about fitting to uh, perhaps not 
very uh, modern structures that are there. So, you know, um, and the other thing is that um, be prepared to, to um, interact with people that always think that you don't know anything. Like, and, and this always happens when you're doing interdisciplinary science, you know, the linguists think that the cognitive scientist is just completely ignorant about anything linguistic. And the cognitive scientists think that the linguists don't know how to do a basic t-test and the neuroscientists think that, you know, behavior is, is overrated and everyone think the other ones are not getting it. And at some point, if you really want to make progress, you know, you have to say, well, you know, let's just, okay, we are all, you're all great and smart and you're the best, but let's just sit down and get the job done. And, and that, that specific job that the interdisciplinary people do, I think that's not, um, that's not very um, appreciated because you know, as an interdisciplinary person, you will never be an expert on any of the things you work on. But the good thing that you bring up is that you are able to speak, talk between disciplines and okay, yeah, this is, this is becoming too long. And I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I, I don't know, just, just make sure that, that people call you something uh, that you agree with, a linguist, anthropologist, data scientist, and, and, and that's it. Then go and have fun, do interdisciplinary stuff, but make sure that you fit somewhere. <laughs> Thanks, Damien. That's, that's the reality of current academia, but that doesn't prohibit us from, from doing interdisciplinary work and, and getting to know other researchers from other fields and learning so much from them. Thanks again. Thanks again. Thank you, Caius, for conducting this excellent debate. And Damien and Caius, if you will allow me, I have a question. I would like to know what you think about face mask and linguistic diversity. Because with the, with the pandemic, people have been forced to wear face mask, and several people say that is difficult to speak and hear sound with masks. Can an exter uh, external device constrain the sound change? Is there any evidence in the history? What do you think about this? So I, I, I think, well, you, Caius, if you're okay, I'll just, I'll just say what I know about this, which is not a lot, but what I have to say is, I, there are good studies already out there showing how comprehension drops if you're using if you're wearing a mask, and and that that's why in in some intensive care units and stuff like that, people end up using masks that are translucent, because clearly it matters. And you know there is a whole uh, mouth speech integration, etc. Now what I do know, and again I apologize for not remembering the name of the authors of this study is that there might be some uh, uh, language change happening with sign languages and Zoom. So there's so much of, I don't remember the specifics of this, but that was a very compelling case study. And you know we have this huge natural experiment where suddenly all humans are doing something that is very weird. And you know, surely there's going to be some difference at some point. Oh, thank you so much. Dem and Cass for your collaboration with the service Abelin ao Vivo. I would li uh, like to thank you and to take this opportunity to invite everyone to continue watching the Abelin ao Vivo series. Thank you, everyone. Until next time. <laughs>